Hello everyone, FPL Raptor here and welcome back to another video on my YouTube channel. In today's video we have my match day two team selection in a World Cup fantasy football and my wild card will be active so you'll see that draft here today. If you're enjoying the content here on this channel and you're enjoying the World Cup fantasy football content, please do remember to like, comment and subscribe. But without further ado, let's jump to today's video. So on your screen, you will see how my team has done for match day one. Not particularly great, but also not completely terrible, I don't think anyway. It's very difficult to gauge because I don't even know how many players are playing World Cup Fantasy Football. I can't seem to find that information. And also, I think there's been quite a few high scoring players, but not necessarily players that everyone would own. Maybe like Olivier Giroud might be a player that a lot of people that maybe play quite seriously in a proper fantasy football managers might have owned. But outside of that, a lot of the more popular players have either blanked or, as you can see here, picked up sort of six, seven points. So... I'll leave this on the screen whilst I'm talking. Just to address a few things, the game is an absolute mess right now. And I think if I wasn't trying to create content and entertain you, and I didn't want just something to keep me going whilst I was missing FPL essentially, then I probably would have packed it in by now. And I don't blame you if you're considering doing so. There are bugs, there are glitches, the points aren't coming up, and they're changing the rules midway through. Like suddenly, apparently, a midfielder now gets seven points for a goal rather than five points. It's just a bit of a mess. So I fully appreciate that. I'm not trying to say that it's a great game. And like I said, if I weren't creating content, I weren't trying to just entertain you guys and keep you going and also just have a bit of fun myself over the World Cup, I may well have packed it in. That being said, I don't think I'm going to pack it in. What I've decided to do instead is just have a bit of fun with it or at least try to under the circumstances. So usually with fantasy football, especially FPL, I take it very seriously. I try and optimize my team, pick the perfect team and use the perfect strategy every time. I've decided to just not bother with that. I'm not bothering with any unlimited budget hacks that are going around at the moment. I'm not bothering trying to cheat the system with the wild card. I discussed in my previous video that you might be able to play a wild card in match day two, but also for match day three. I'm just not bothering with any of that. I'm just going to try and have fun. I'm going to pick a team that I like each week, pick players that I want to watch. And if it does well, great. And if I have an absolutely horrid time and my players don't get any points, it doesn't really matter. It's only seven match days. And really what I care about and what we care about on this channel and for most of us is, is FPL. So I've got that new approach now. I'm having fun with it. The team hasn't done that badly. It's not because I've had a shocking start. And as a result, I'm pretending I don't care. Like I've got four clean sheets at the back with Unai Simone, Borna Sosa, Dumfries and Mela. I've got Mbappe with the nine pointer. Messi did get a return. I switched the armband off of Messi onto De Bruyne. In, in the hope of having a bit of fun with it because now midfielders get seven points for goals as opposed to five. Belgium were really, really poor. Canada were excellent, as we'll discuss in sort of my match day two team selection. So that was a bit of a shame, but I only lost a few points in the end because I still own Messi. It's worth noting again, another sort of issue with the, the game at the moment. Messi's currently noted as having six points, but he did have two shots on target. So he should be on seven points. So I've put him on seven, but if he stays on six, then of course I'd be on 49 points. The rest of the team's done all right. I've still got Neymar and Cancelo to play. I subbed off Martinez, Depaul and Trippier for Borna Sosa, Cancelo and Neymar. And yeah, the team's done okay. I'm, I'm not disliking the World Cup fantasy sort of approach. I, I think the game itself is, isn't great, right? There's, there's multiple issues with the game. I'm still enjoying it a little bit and I'm very much enjoying the World Cup. I'm very excited for FPL to come back already. And I think what this has done is made me appreciate the simplicity of FPL. But with all of that being said, that's how I've got on in match day one. Still two players left to go. A captaincy blank, unfortunately. That's what happens when you risk switching the captains. Captaincy. So let's look ahead to match day two and what my current wildcard draft is looking like. So having said all of that, let's have some fun with it and let's pick a wild card that we want to play. Now, Unfortunately, it's not that different from my match day one team. So I probably don't need to play the wild card, but considering I think we're just trying to keep it going and have some fun, I think I'm gonna play it in match day two. And it may well be that I play my power captain in match day three, even though it might be more useful in the quarters or semis, because again, I just wanna have a bit of fun with it. And maybe if we play loads of chips early on, we can get up pretty high before we come crashing down in the knockout stages. So with all that being said, this is not a final wild card draft. Unfortunately, I can't even build the wild card draft. It's another issue of the game that match day two hasn't unlocked yet at the time of me recording this on Wednesday evening. So I can't actually build it. So I think I've done the math correct with all of these players, but we've had to do it manually. So as soon as I can play the wild card, I think I will. I don't necessarily think you need to. I think it could be useful in match day three when we're expecting some rotation. And I also think it could be useful in the knockout stages. Of course, for round of 16, you're going to get uh, unlimited transfers anyway. Everyone will. But you could play it in the quarterfinals if you get anything wrong. Because, of course, you've got to back certain teams to progress. So if you back all of the wrong teams, it might be that you can use the wild card to sort of use it as like a get out of jail free card for the knockout stages. So I would say... Match day two, three or quarter finals. I definitely wouldn't play it in the semis or the final. I'm just going to play it in match day two to have a bit of fun. So in defense, I should say I've also got one million in the bank. I've left that there. 
I will use that 1 million, but because I don't actually know exactly where yet. There are a few places I could use it, a few players that might need upgrading. For example, we haven't seen the Brazil and Portugal teams yet. That might change my opinion on who I want, and I'll try and take all of that into account. So starting in goal, I've got Emi Martinez and Roche Ferreira Rocha. We, I still don't know how to pronounce his name. The Uruguay starting goalkeeper, or at least we think he'll be the Uruguay starting goalkeeper. I think I want Emi Martinez because... I do think they struggled a little bit against Saudi Arabia, but two things to note with Argentina. I think on any other day, they win that 4-5-6-2. I think they had so many close calls with offsides, almost scoring a couple of good, uh, a few good saves from the Saudi goalkeeper. So I still think that Argentina put in a decent performance. And I think moving forward, I still expect them to do fairly well. And yes, Saudi Arabia did score two goals. But again, I don't necessarily think that they conceded a load of chances. And it was a bit of a freak game. I think moving forward, I still expect Argentina to do well. And I think... There are a couple of goalkeepers. Like, for example, I don't mind if you want to go for the Dutch goalkeeper for 4.5, but there could still be some rotation there. I think there are a few decent cheaper keepers, cheaper keepers, but I think that I prefer the 5.5s. And for now, I've got Emmy Masters in there. It could end up being any of the other 5.5s, but I do think I prefer having one decent keeper and then one much cheaper keeper. And then in the back line, I've gone for realistically some attacking defenders because, again, in the name of having some fun with it, I've got Trippier. I think a lot of people will start to flock towards Luke Shaw now because obviously he was very, very attacking in that opening game. I still think Trippier will be on slightly more set pieces than Shaw. I think they shared him in that first game, but I still expect Trippier to be in slightly more set pieces. I still expect him to be on most direct free kicks as well. And we know how good his delivery is. That isn't to take anything away from Luke Shaw. I'm a Manchester United fan. I absolutely love him. I still think Trippier is the slightly better player to own, though. And I'm trying to not get too carried away from what we saw in match day one. I've got Dumfries in there. I think two good fixtures now for the Netherlands. And they did look fairly decent defensively. I think they are a defense that will keep clean sheets for the remainder of the tournament. I expect them to progress through to the knockout stages. Of course, if they win in match day two and they're through, we might see some rotation in match day three. But I can't really start thinking about that now. I think Dumfries will be fine. If I desperately need money, I don't think there's a huge issue with going for Ake at 5 million. I wouldn't go for the like, I think Van Dyke is 6 million. So I wouldn't necessarily go for Van Dyke at 6. I think I would just go for Ake if I'm going to downgrade. And then maybe you could use the 1 million elsewhere. But for me, I think it's probably worth paying that extra million for a bit of attacking threat from Dumfries. I've got Borna Sosa still in there. At 3.5 million feels like a no-brainer. Croatia did look pretty good defensively. And whilst it is important to have a strong bench and to have 15 good players, I don't necessarily think you need to spend loads of money in each spot. And I think when you get a, such an attacking fullback like we have with Borna Sosa, it feels like a bit of a no-brainer. He actually got quite a few opportunities to get attacking returns in the game in match day one as well. There was one really, really big opportunity for an assist. So I think Borna Sosa is still fantastic value. And for me, he's the best sort of cheap budget defender. I've got Theo Hernandez. Now against quite a few predictions, Lucas Hernandez actually started at left back for France and Theo Hernandez. Hernandez was on the bench. However, Lucas Hernandez came off injured. Theo Hernandez came on, got an assist, and apparently looked very good. I didn't actually get a chance to watch this game, but apparently looked very good. If Lucas Hernandez is out, and even maybe if he's not, maybe Theo Hernandez gets the nod. I do think he's more attacking than Pavard, but Pavard is slightly more nailed. So let's see what happens with that injury there. But I do think I want a France defender in there. France were one of the more impressive teams in match day one. Yes, it was a, a slightly easy fixture against Aust Australia, but I don't think they're necessarily a very weak team. France just overran them, and I think they looked very good. And I think they are probably back up there with the tournament favorites. A lot of people hadn't written them off, but we were all talking about the South American teams. And I think France have just shown, along with Spain, as we're going to move on to, why they are so good and why they have been tournament favorites in the past. And the fifth and final defender is Alex Tellez. Now, I need to wait for the Brazil lineup before fully deciding this. I do have one million in the bank, so I have some options to upgrade. I could even go like Tellez to Ake if I wanted to, or I could go for another 4.5 million pound defender. I need to wait to see, but we think Tellez will be the starting left back for Brazil in this tournament. And if that is the case, two really nice fixtures in match day two and match day three. We know from his time in the Premier League and also his time at Porto, he is a very attacking defender, maybe been a little bit suspect defensively, but I do expect him to get on, to have opportunities to get attacking returns, whether that be assist, his crossing is very, very good. He has taken penalties in the past. Now, I think Neymar will be on it. I think there are some above him as well. But that, I suppose, is a small possibility at some point. And also, he might take some corners for them. But I need to see how Brazil line up. I need to see what his role is in that team. But if he does start for Brazil away into their defense at 4.5 million. I think he is a really nice option, but I do have that 1 million in the bank. And I think both Sosa and Tellez are two spots where I could see myself using that 1 million if I want to, if I want to upgrade Sosa, or if I think Tellez isn't going to be the starting left back for Brazil. So those are the keepers in the defense. Let me know down below what you think of that first part of the team. Let's now move on to the midfield. So moving on to the midfield, and I'll be honest, I don't really like any of these picks at all. In fact, I don't think there's a single midfielder in World Cup fantasy football that I think I really want that player for match day two. There are a few that 
that I would quite like for match day three, especially the Spain midfielders I'm thinking about. But Spain play against Germany in match day two. Yes, Germany didn't look great in match day one, but I still don't think that's a fixture that I want to target. And considering I will have transfers both in match day two and match day three to bring in the Spain players for a, a much better fixture, I think I would rather do that than necessarily picking loads of them in match day two. So I'm in a position where I've picked some players. I don't necessarily love any of them. De Bruyne, Bergwijn and De Paul were all in my match day one team. We'll start with De Bruyne because on the back of that Belgian performance, I think a lot of people will look at that and go, why on earth are you picking De Bruyne? He did play very deep. Belgium didn't look great at all. But we are still talking about one of the best, if not the best midfielders in world football. And I just think I've got money to spare. I like my forwards. I like my defense. I've still got one million in the bank. If I don't like any of the mid or budget price midfielders anyway, why not just pick one of the best footballers in world football in De Bruyne and just hope that he turns it on in match day two? I know that's not a great way to approach the game, but again, I'm playing this as a casual. Why not just pick a player that I like and that I know can do well on his day? The issue we've got is he's not really a massive goal scorer at any point in his career. He's more of an assister. And midfielders are getting seven points now for a goal. That's a sudden rule change that they did midway through match day one. So maybe we're more interested in those goal scoring midfielders. I'm thinking about maybe Bruno Fernandes, if he's on penalties, could be a decent option. Let's see how Portugal line up. Maybe some other sort of midfielders, people, players that are listed as midfielders, but are actually playing as forwards. Maybe they'll be better options for us. But for now... De Bruyne stays. Let me know, by the way, down below, are there any midfielders that you really like the look of? I do quite like the look of, um, for example, like Olmo or Asensio if he does play. But my issue is with these players that, again, the fixture in match day two just isn't great. And I'm going to have transfers to bring them in for match day three. Bergwijn is a midfielder that is playing out of position as a forward. I don't think the Netherlands look great in match day one, but two decent fixtures now for match day two and match day three. And I still expect Bergwijn to be the starting striker in both of those games. So I'll pick him. I would probably prefer Depay once Depay comes into the starting 11. But of course, Depay is listed as a forward. Bergwijn is listed as a midfielder. So that's the reason I've got Bergwijn in there. And I still think at 7 million, despite him blanking in match day one, he's still probably one of the better midfielders to pick. I've also got Saka in my team. This feels very much like a casual move to make. Saka got one of the biggest scores, if not the biggest score in match day one. Let's just put him in our team. But he did look very good. And I think what I want in that spot, it doesn't have to be Saka. I want a starting attacker for England. England put six past Iran. I know people are saying it's just Iran. But Iran are a team that in the past have been fairly resolute defensively and not conceded that many goals. And I think to put six goals past anyone, as we've seen in this tournament, there can be major upsets. I still think that's very impressive. So seeing England putting goals past teams for fun is something that I would enjoy, especially owning a player in my World Cup fantasy football team. So for now, Saka's in there. If I get news that Foden's starting either ahead of Saka or ahead of Sterling, I wouldn't mind putting Foden in my team. I think that could be a really nice pick. But for now, just because I think he's most likely to start and he looks really good in match day one and because he's fairly cheap at 8 million, I've got Saka. I think Bellingham could be a good pick at 7.5 if Grealish gets the nod. There are loads of good players. It really depends on the news of who starts. For now, I've got Saka in there. If we get an inkling that Foden could be the one to start, maybe Foden comes in for that position. And so the final two players that we're left with in the midfield are the two cheaper players that allow us to get a fairly decent midfield defense and three really good forwards in, which is Buchanan and DePaul. Now, Buchanan, I'll be honest, is a player that I'd never even heard of before watching the Canada versus Belgium game. Apparently, I think he plays for Club Bruges. He was absolutely excellent. And just a player that I was actually really excited watching. As a result, I've put him on my team. And this is the way I'm playing. I think Canada looked really, really good. The only issue we've got with Canada and also Buchanan himself is they just didn't finish any of their chances. Their finishing was poor. Their final pass was really poor as well. So let's see if they improve that in match day two and match day three. But I think around that sort of five to seven million pound price range, I don't really love any of the players. But Buchanan excited me when I watched him. And I do think he has quality on the ball. So for, for me... Buchanan is going to be in there at 5.5. And then I've got DePaul at 5. I've had him in match day one. I was not impressed by him particularly at all. And this is both from a fantasy perspective and also from a football perspective. But I do know DePaul is a good footballer. And I also think at 5 million, he's going to be more attacking than most of the other midfielders of that price bracket. So DePaul and Buchanan in there as sort of budget enablers just to fill the squad. But Buchanan in particular, I think could be a really nice differential. And I was just really impressed eye test wise of his performance in match day one. So that's the midfield. I don't really love any of them. Like I said, please do let me know down below if there are any midfielders that you like that you think I've missed out that have a good fixture in two and maybe also three as well. 
Let's now move on to the forwards and the bench. So moving on to the forwards, I have, let's start with Messi and Neymar, two more premiums alongside De Bruyne. I do think that, again, Argentina weren't great in match day one, but I still want to own Messi in this World Cup. And it'll probably be one of the only opportunities I'll ever have because I don't play UCL fantasy to own Messi in a fantasy football game. So let's back Argentina to bounce back in match day two. He'll probably be my first captain and I'll probably switch the captain off of him again, potentially, if he only gets one return. If he gets two returns, I'll probably keep the armband on him. I've got Neymar as my third premium. I haven't seen Brazil yet. I haven't seen how they line up. If I think Rafinha or Richarlison look really good, maybe I'll go for them ahead of Neymar. But Neymar is Neymar. He's fantastic. I expect Brazil to score goals. And also, as far as we know at this point, Neymar will be on penalties as well. So Neymar makes it in as my third premium. And then I've got Giroud at the moment. Now, Olivier Giroud has been a player that has been sort of underrated for many years now, but I think we've been saying that so much that maybe he's no longer underrated. He's a player that scores goals, both for France and at club level. And I just think he looked really, really good. I watched the highlights from the game. Again, I, as I said, I didn't watch the full game, but he looked really, really good in the highlights. A lot of people were raving about him. And I think he's a player that, again, will score goals as, as long as he starts. And with Benzema being out of the World Cup, I'm expecting Giroud to continue starting for France. Now, I suppose the only... Not issue I have, but the small caveat here around Giroud is if I drop De Bruyne to an £8 million midfielder, because I've got £1 million in the bank, I can then go Giroud to Mbappe. So rather than Giroud and De Bruyne, I could go Mbappe and an £8 million or less midfielder. And I think a lot of people, especially considering De Bruyne's performance, might say that's the better play. Maybe I'm getting carried away from match day one with Giroud getting a brace. Mbappe is probably the better player to own. I probably feel more comfortable captain in Mbappe than I would captain in De Bruyne. So... I, th I think the, the most likely change in this team at the moment is probably Giroud and De Bruyne to Mbappe and a mid-price midfielder. The rest of the team I'm relatively happy with, but I do want to just keep an eye on Tellez and also Neymar to make sure that they're starting and I'm happy with their roles in match day one so that I feel comfortable picking them through to match day two. So let me know down below. If there are any players you think that I haven't considered that you would want for match day two, again, I know the Spain players are going to be massively in demand. I just think I would rather wait, let them play Germany. I know Germany weren't great, but I still don't really want to target that fixture and then bring one or two of them in for match day three. Probably just one of them, but maybe two in for match day three. So the only real decision that I need your help with is De Bruyne and Giroud versus Mbappe and a mid-price midfielder. At the moment, I'm leaning this way just because I think Giroud's great and I, I feel like I, I still trust De Bruyne to do fairly well, but I do quite like the idea of having Mbappe, especially for captaincy. So guys, there you have it. That is my match day two team selection, or I should say my wild card draft. Hopefully you are still enjoying the World Cup fantasy football content. And if you are, please do drop a like on the video. Please do drop a comment down below to feed the algorithm gods. And also make sure to subscribe as well. I do really appreciate the support. Until next time, thank you very much for watching. Cheers. Bye-bye.